Well, it's clear that Jesus has moved on from the Beatitudes. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the peacemakers, right? He's moved on from the Beatitudes, and he's moved into a new section of his sermon. Here, Jesus begins a discussion on the law. The law and the role of the law isn't talked about very much in the church. It's not a secret that the mainstream so-called Christian culture is far more interested in grace than it is law. And certainly we need to emphasize the, the grace of God in the gospel. But when we come across passages like these, we begin to realize that the law is not something that Jesus shied away from talking about. In fact, his culture was saturated in thoughts concerning the Old Covenant law of God. Sometimes we don't realize why Jesus is bringing something up because it's so foreign to our own culture, right? How many conversations about the Old Covenant law of God have you had with friends this week? Well, I believe it'd be a little different if you were a first century Jew. Consider with me the context of Jesus' earthly ministry. First century Judaism was highly focused on the Old Covenant law. Although Israel had a history of breaking their Mosaic covenant with God, they had come out of Babylonian exile and captivity, and they were reestablished in their land, albeit under Roman occupation. They were allowed to worship freely, and the temple was rebuilt. There was a temple for them to offer sacrifices in, unlike today. Sacrifices and Jewish feast holidays were kept. We saw Jesus going to all sorts of these feast holidays up at Jerusalem. The, ta- the, the feasts of booths, the Passover, right? Sukkot, which they call. And the average Jew was aware of God's law due to the plethora of Pharisees that were teaching in synagogues all over the land, Right? It's not as if you had to go to Jerusalem to hear the law of God because in every town there was a Pharisee teaching in the synagogue the law of God. Did you know that it is estimated by the Jewish historian Josephus that there were at least 6,000 Pharisees teaching at the time of Jesus' earthly ministry? 6,000. The role of the Pharisee was to teach the law of God to the people. They themselves sought to uphold a strict personal obedience to the law. The word Pharisee simply means separatist. They were the ones who were seeking to be separate from the rest of the population. They were separatists. And the the Pharisees were, in their minds, the separate ones. They supposed that they were the ones that were actually keeping the law. They were seeking to be the ones who kept the law. They were separate from the rest of the population that was slightly less of law keepers than them. And they tried to do this by creating additional laws that would keep them further away from disobedience to the actual law of God. They set up additional rules. They called it building a hedge around the Torah. It goes something like this. Imagine for me, so so my daughter, Mercy, um, we've got a front yard, we've got a backyard, but there are rules that you don't go out into the streets. Because if you go out into the street, you're going to possibly get hit by a car and die. So it'd be like if the law was don't go out in the street. If I was being a Pharisee, I would say, not only do I not want you to go in the street, I'm sorry, but you can't even go in the front yard. Because if you don't go in the front yard, then you can't get into the street. So I'm going to build a hedge around the road by making it so you can't even go into the front yard. That's what the Pharisees sought to do. They said, um, God says that we should do certain things on the Sabbath, but because we're so scared that we're going to break those laws, let's set up additional laws so that we don't even come close to breaking the ones that God has actually established. And so they not only taught the law of God, but also their laws as well to the people. And that was the standard that they held for the populace. The land was saturated in the teaching of the law and the prophets, and the land was saturated in the teaching of the Pharisees. This was the culture to which Jesus began to say in verse 17, do not think that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. And in this saturation, there were some who began to question Jesus' commitment to the Old Covenant law. 
A criticism began to be brought up by the Pharisees that Jesus didn't honor the law of God. And not only the Pharisees, it got into the populace. Even John the Baptist's disciples began to have these questions. And we see this all throughout the book of Matthew. These criticisms are all over the book of Matthew. Let me give you a few examples. In Matthew 9, 14, the disciples of John the Baptist question Jesus, and they say this, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? They question Jesus' piety, his commitment to holiness, and implicitly, his reverence for the law of God, right? Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples are not required to Jesus, there seems like there's something off about your requirements, your obedience to the pharisaical fasting rules that you must fast twice a week. Even though there's no such prescription in God's law, the Pharisees had taught so pervasively that you are to be a faster even twice a week that John the Baptist's disciples thought maybe something was off with the way Jesus was obeying the old covenant law. Matthew 11 18 through 19, Jesus voices the criticism of those around him. He he says what they're thinking. He says, John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. But the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunker, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. This exclamation points out that the people of Israel had a problem with the company that Jesus kept. Their charge against him was that Jesus, because he kept the company of tax collectors and sinners, must not have a high commitment to the law, and he must not care about holiness very much. In their mind, his association deemed him suspect. In Matthew 12, 1 through 8, Jesus and his disciples are accused of breaking the Sabbath by picking grain heads. And in Matthew 15, 1 through 20, Jesus' ritual purity is brought into question when he doesn't make his disciples wash their hands before they eat. All of these criticisms were expressions of a mounting criticism in the culture of Jesus' earthly ministry. The Jews had a problem that Jesus, maybe he didn't honor the old covenant law, that maybe his teaching was inconsistent with the law, and maybe he himself was a lawbreaker and thus a blasphemer because one who breaks God's law cannot be God. And Jesus says he is God. This was the charge that put Jesus on the cross. He is a lawbreaker. He associates with tax collectors and sinners. He's broken the Sabbath. He doesn't follow our purity rituals. How On earth could he be the Christ? This is the culture of Jesus' earthly ministry. And against this cultural backdrop, Jesus says in verse 17, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. It is important that we know this cultural backdrop because it unlocks the reason why he's even bringing this up to his disciples. Why is he bringing it up that he has not come to abolish the law and the prophets? Because Jesus wants to instruct his disciples regarding the reality that he is upholding the Old Testament law despite what the critics might say. Martin Lloyd-Jones explains that Jesus is establishing two propositions here. The first one is that Jesus' teaching does not contradict the Old Testament. It is in harmony with the Old Testament, okay? Jesus' teaching does not contradict the Old Testament. It's in harmony with the Old Testament. That's what he's driving at. And number two, Jesus' teaching is in opposition to the teaching of the Pharisees. These two realities, I am not inconsistent with the law of God, but I am coming against the law of the Pharisees. He is splitting the two apart, the law of the Pharisees, and the law of God. In verse 17, Jesus begins with the words, do not think, right? He is saying this directly to his disciples. He doesn't want them to fall into the thinking of what the Pharisees are thinking. He doesn't want them to think the same thing. So do not think, disciples who are his audience, that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. 
He didn't want them thinking that his teaching contradicted the law of God. He didn't want them thinking he was abolishing the law and the prophets. Jesus was doing no such thing. He explains this with explicit language in this text. Jesus did not come on the scene to dismiss the law of God. I think that's very clear from this text. Jesus did not come to dismiss the law of God. And that is what the critics were saying. Jesus is not here to keep the old covenant law is what they were saying against him. He is dismissing it. He's not honoring it. And Jesus says, no, my teaching is consistent with the law. He came to fulfill the law and the prophets. There's some background for you as to why he's saying it. So now let's ask some questions. How so? How so? What does it mean that Jesus didn't abolish the law? What does that mean? Simply, it means that he's not doing away with the old covenant law. It's actually pretty simple. He's not doing away with the old covenant law. He is not denigrating it. He didn't come to make it worthless. Jesus actually kept the law of God, obeying it perfectly. He hasn't come to tell the Jews to suddenly be lax in their obedience to God. He has not come to tell them that their law is worthless. He hasn't come to abolish the law. Now, another question arises, what does it mean when Jesus says he came to fulfill the law and the prophets? What does this word fulfill mean? Well, there are a few uh, positions on this, and, and I don't have time to get into all of them. You're actually probably pretty familiar with some of them, but this seems to be a complicated issue uh, for new covenant believers to really understand what, what does all of this mean. And there's a lot of nuance there, so follow with me. There's a few positions. I'll give, you, I'll give you a few. One says that Jesus is essentially saying, when he says he came to fulfill the law, that he's saying that he has come to end the law. They say that fulfilling means ending, but this doesn't make any sense given the kind of language Jesus is using here uh, concerning how the law will continue until heaven and earth will pass away, right? Do you see that in your text, verse 6, 16, 17, 18? He says, until heaven and earth pass away, the law is not passing away. So it wouldn't make much sense to say that the law is ending because he's saying it's going to continue until the second coming, Right? So that position doesn't make much sense. He makes it very clear that the law continues, even if it takes on a different function in the lives of new covenant believers. It's not ending, it takes on a different function. Another view says that fulfilling here simply means completing. So the view says that Jesus is essentially completing the law with his teaching. In this view, the law was not clear enough it was lacking, but Jesus came and gave us additional law to put alongside the old covenant law so that we can obey all of God's law more perfectly. This means that potentially none of the law is actually gone, but now we also have additional law. Jesus came to complete it, give us the extra that was necessary for our obedience. In some cases, this position has led to movements that embrace Jesus as Savior, but require people to follow the various dietary laws and other Old Covenant rituals in order to have extra holiness, right? Yet the New Testament is pretty clear that Jesus' teaching is not simply the cherry on top of the Old Covenant law. It's not just the little extra that now, oh, good, Good, we got the little cherry on top of the old covenant law. We've got what we need now that he put the final piece into the puzzle of the law. The new covenant believer is in the words of Romans 6.14, no longer under the law, but under grace, right? So if Jesus is saying that he has come to fulfill the law, and it doesn't mean that he's ending the law, and it doesn't mean that he is completing the law, what does it mean? Well, given the other ways that fulfill is used in the book of Matthew, if we kind of zoomed out in Matthew and, and looked at everywhere he uses this exact same Greek word, fulfill, uh, we would actually come to the conclusion that Jesus is saying that he himself is the fulfillment of the law. 
The book of Matthew is actually devoted to showing this reality. This is one of Matthew's primary themes. Uh, His main theme is to show the correlation between the Old Testament prophecies and their fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Uh, We associate the gospel of Matthew as being to the Jews in order to show that Jesus is the Christ according to the scriptures, right? And so look at the first three chapters of Matthew alone, and you have five different Old Testament quotations that Matthew is saying are fulfilled in Christ, right? Looking at his birth narrative and his very beginnings of his ministry, we see these Old Testament quotations that Matthew is saying are fulfilled in Jesus. And there are actually 19 of these kinds of quotations throughout the entire book of Matthew because Matthew is providing a very strong case to the readers of his gospel that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. Testament prophecies concerning the Christ and who he is. So the word fulfill, the most likely option according to the whole book of Matthew is that Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. Perhaps you'll remember with me that in the transfiguration, they go up the mountain, Jesus and Peter, James and John, and Moses and Elijah appear. Moses being the representative of the law and Elijah being the representative of the prophets. And God says, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. It's not to denigrate Moses or Elijah, but to say, follow Jesus. That's what's happening. He is the fulfillment of Moses, the law, and Elijah, the prophets. Follow Jesus. Jesus didn't come to abolish the law. He didn't come to do away with it. He came to be the fulfillment of it. Jesus, Galatians 4.4, tells us that he was born under the law to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Jesus was born into the world a Jew, He was born under the law. He was outside of the law of God. He was the law giver, but he chose to come down and be born of a Jew to live under the law so that he might satisfy the law's demands of perfect obedience on our behalf. He kept the law perfectly, thus fulfilling the law and the prophets. All of the law and all of the prophets were pointing to Jesus who then came and fulfilled it, born under the law a Jew and completing it by perfect obedience to it for our sake, right? We cannot divorce the law also from the gospel. The saving work of Jesus dying on the cross is tied inextricably to the law of God. Jesus' death was the righteous punishment of the law. The sins of those who believe were condemned in Jesus' body according to the law. It was lawful for him to pay the penalty of the curses of the law. Believer, your sin was punished lawfully. The punishment was satisfied on the cross because all of the curses of the law that we deserve for our disobedience to the law fell upon Jesus entirely. Therefore, there's no more punishment left to give. It got what it deserved. The wages of sin was death, and death was required. And Jesus satisfied that requirement in his body. His perfect obedience to the law also produced the righteousness that I could never earn. The fact that he perfectly fulfilled the law of God in perfect obedience is now mine in Christ. Listen, our righteousness is not also divorced from the law. It is in Jesus' keeping the law of God that we have that righteousness. It is Jesus' perfect obedience to the law that is imputed to us. Thus, our righteousness is also lawful. So to say that Jesus has come to abolish the law isn't true because the law is still kept by Christ in you through the Holy Spirit. And when you stand before God at the judgment seat of Christ, either you are the one who did not receive 
the law-keeping righteousness of Jesus through the gospel and are thus condemned for your law-breaking, or you are received as a law-keeper through the law-keeper, Jesus Christ. I hope this is making some sense, but nothing in our lives as a Christian is divorced from the law. Therefore, the law has not ended. It is fulfilled. So verse 17 is about Jesus saying something like this. Let me paraphrase it for you, and maybe this will be helpful in your understanding of of what he's saying. Verse 17, he's, he's saying something like this. Followers of Jesus, despite what the crowds and the Pharisees might say, I do not want you to think that I have come to get rid of the law and the prophets. They point to me, and I am their fulfillment. And now everything I'm about to say in the rest of this sermon is consistent with the law, and is not in contradiction with the law. Jesus then goes on in verse 18, and he further emphasizes the law's ongoing usefulness. He says that until heaven and earth pass away, nothing will pass from the law. The law still stands as useful to us. We know this, church. We don't believe that we need to throw away our Old Testaments, do we? We don't act like... They're of no use to us today. We uphold the sufficiency of the whole Bible to lead us and make us godly. We don't, we're not only New Testament Christians. We believe that the Old Testament has much for us in terms of our growth, our sanctification, our knowing of God, our worshiping of him rightly. So the law is, is useful in an ongoing way. I would never tell you, don't worry about reading the first five books of the Bible. They're obsolete. Because they're not obsolete. Because they still stand as useful to us today, even if they take on a different function in our lives as New Covenant believers. The difficulty with this verse, typically, uh, is regarding what Jesus means by nothing. Nothing will pass away from the law. What's this nothing that will not pass away? Does that mean that Christians are to keep all of the rituals of the Old Testament law? Are we to keep the dietary laws? Should we offer sacrifices? Uh, We instinctively uh, say no. Nobody in here that that I know uh, would be like, yeah, yeah, I think that I shouldn't eat shellfish and I think that I should keep all the dietary restrictions and I grow these nice long sideburns. Uh, we're, we're We're not given to defaulting towards thinking that that's what we should do, but there's maybe a question in our spirit when we read that nothing passes from the law and we go, wait, the law is all filled with these kinds of things. Do these pass away? It seems like Jesus is saying that they don't pass away. So what is he saying about this nothing? Well, remember that Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. And briefly, let me, let me you, you probably are familiar with the, the theological distinctions between the different facets of the law, but let's go into it briefly uh, for your benefit. Uh, traditionally, theologians will uh, split the law into three categories, right? The, the, the ceremonial law, the civil law, and the moral law, Right? So go with me into your systematic theology brains for one second. Let's talk about these three. Jesus is the fulfillment of all three of these categories. All three. That's my conviction. You can take a different position, but I believe that Jesus fulfilled all three of these categories. And we're not under any of these categories. Let me explain. The ceremonial law is fulfilled in Christ. The ceremonial law refers to the various rituals and sacrifices that the nation of Israel was to perform. It was things like, in the book of Leviticus, right, burnt offerings and sin offerings and grain offerings, right, the Day of Atonement, the, the, the passing of the sins of Israel through uh, the mediator of the high priest onto an animal or, or some kind of uh, harvest of a crop or whatever uh, meant to atone for the sins of or seek God's blessing upon, right? We see these all in the book of Leviticus. This is the ceremonial law. And the ceremonial law, the, the book of Hebrews, the author of the book of Hebrews openly declares uh, is ended through Jesus. That Jesus is the end of the sacrificial system, right? He says this in chapter 9, verses 15 through 28, uh, that the sacrifices were copies of the true things. They are the shadow and the substance is Christ. And that Jesus has 
Here it is. Appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Jesus is, in the book of Hebrews, uh, shown to be the high priest and the sacrifice. And he offers up his own body once for all for the sins of those who will believe. That there is no need for an additional sacrifice because the book of Hebrews then says uh, that the high priests have to offer the same sacrifices year after year after year, day after day after day, and they never actually atone because they're copies of the heavenly things, the reality that when Jesus died on the cross, that the sacrifice of his body was the final and true sacrifice and the only sufficient sacrifice to save. Therefore, the shadows are no longer needed because the substance is here. The ceremonial law is fulfilled because Christ has fulfilled it in the sacrifice of himself. The civil law is also fulfilled in Christ. These are the parts of the law that showed Israel how to function as a theocracy, right? A theocracy. Jesus comes, and in Matthew, it's immediately noted um, that Jesus has come to establish the kingdom of God, a new government, right? The government shall be upon his shoulders. Here's the kingdom of God. And so the king is here, therefore the kingdom has come. That's the first message in Matthew concerning the ministry of Jesus. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's here. Alongside this, salvation is now no longer just for the nation of Israel. The kingdom of God is not nationally exclusive. Jews and Gentiles are welcome in the kingdom of God. That there will be people from every tribe and every tongue and every nation at the wedding supper of the Lamb. So the theocracy of Israel, the civil law, is fulfilled in Jesus in bringing the kingdom of God, which is not nationally exclusive, but all are invited through repentance and faith to be a part of the new Israel, the kingdom of God. The moral law and how it's fulfilled is perhaps a bit more tricky. And this is where I I know that if you're like, I don't know, I don't know, Pastor Alex, this is where we might disagree. But maybe I can convince you this morning that the moral law is also fulfilled in Jesus. Listen, God hates what God hates, and God loves what God loves. We get tripped up there. If someone were to come to you and say, I know God says he hates murder in the Old Testament, but oh, so much grace, so much mercy is afforded me through Christ that, that if I, I think I'm going to murder, and you know what, I don't think the, the New Testament is strict or harsh against that. I think maybe it's more acceptable because of the grace. Uh, no, no. God hates what God hates from Old Testament to New Testament. He has not changed his mind concerning what he believes is morally acceptable. And he loves what he loves. He hasn't changed what he thinks is morally wonderful. God hasn't changed. The covenant has changed. But in the midst of it, Jesus fulfills the requirements of the moral law. So, God's morality doesn't change, but his covenant does, right? In the next section, Jesus is going to start telling us that the law didn't go deep enough, right? He's going to start saying, you have heard it said, do not murder. But I say to you, if you're angry, you're a murderer. He's going to He's going to increase the demands of the, of the law. He's going to expose their inability to fully flesh out the heart issues. So he's not doing away with the law, the moral law. He's fulfilling it, but we're still called to obey the fact that we shouldn't be angry or murder because God's mind on the issue has never changed. It's been evil since the first pair of brothers experienced a murder. Jesus only intensifies and deepens the requirements of the moral law, yet he fulfilled it, he fulfilled it by perfect obedience to it. It was a requirement for salvation. 
that one would come and fulfill the moral law so that we would have a legitimate righteousness. But once it's fulfilled, it's fulfilled. In fact, the, the commands of the New Testament are very consistent to the commands of the New Testament. They're, they're, the Old Testament and the New Testament, if you were to line them up, the moral requirements, 99.9% consistency. Why? Because God loves what he loves and God hates what he hates. Let's not be confused by the moral law any longer. The requirements of morality that we have is the same. But we are not held to it because we are not under the law, but under grace. There's a difference between our obedience and the obedience that the Jews were seeking in their stringent obedience to the moral law. All three parts of the law are satisfied, are fulfilled through Jesus Christ, and we are now under grace, but we also see that Paul talks about how we are under the law of Christ. Maybe this is new to you, uh, so I'm going to tell you two verses, and you can go study them further this week. Galatians 6, 2, and 1 Corinthians 9, 21. Galatians 6, 2, and 1 Corinthians 9, 21. In both of these passages, Paul states that we are under the law of Christ. We are not under the old covenant law, ceremonial, civil, moral. They are fulfilled. We are under the law of Christ. We are under grace. But that is not lawlessness, right? What is this law of Christ? Well, Jesus gives us many commands, the chief of them being the summary of the old covenant law, to love the Lord our God and to love one another. Jesus even takes the second one further and says, love one another as I have loved you. He gives substance to that requirement of the law of Christ. Believers are called to obey King Jesus, right? In fact, there's massive overlap between the Old Covenant law and the law of Christ because, again, God loves what he loves and God hates what he hates. I have wanted, this is just an aside, maybe a pastoral aside, but it's it's a, maybe we'll do this someday in a Sunday school, but I'm interested in taking all of the commands of Christ and the New Testament and, and, and seeing what is the law of Christ. What are all the commands that Jesus gave us? What are their correlation with the Old Covenant law? And and let's begin to study that. I don't think we do much of that. Um, We might get a little too caught up on the moral law. Let me tell you, it's fulfilled, and we're under the law of Christ. We're under grace, but we're not lawless. Jesus did not come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill it. The law has not passed away. It has been fulfilled. And let's move on now to verses 19 and 20. They go together, hand in hand, um, so we should, we should really read them together. Um, and Jesus now tells us that we can't relax. We can't relax the Old Covenant law. We must teach it. And that seems confusing until we recognize that God, God has called us to obedience, right? And Jesus did not save us so that we could be lawless, He didn't save you so that you could dive into your sin headlong. He saved you that you might become a law keeper, right? That you would, because there's so much consistency between the old covenant law and the law of Christ, that to teach the old covenant law, to say obey God in the Old Testament, obey what he has to say, is not inconsistent with what we're called to as new new covenant believers, that when we read our Old Testaments, we're not like, well, I know that the Old Testament says this, but I don't know. Uh, I think maybe I've got a pass here. No, you probably don't as it pertains to things concerning morality, who God is, how we worship him rightly. Those things stay the same throughout cover to cover of the Bible. So we don't lax them, but think again back to the culture of the Jews, right? He's being accused of relaxing the commands of the old covenant. He's being accused of being a law breaker. So he's saying, no, you can't lax them. You have to 
Obey them and keep them and teach them. He did not save you so you could dive into your sin. He saved you to be a law keeper. And I'm going to come back to that. Yet the whole of this section culminates in verse 20. And uh, that is really, verse 20 is the thesis statement of Jesus' sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. Everything from the, for the rest of this sermon flows out of the statement Jesus makes in verse 20. He says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This is his thesis statement. And that would have stunned the disciples and those overhearing. The the Pharisees were the supposed benchmark of righteousness and law keeping in Jesus' society. They even had additional laws to build a hedge around the Torah so that they would be sure that they were the obedient ones. And the disciples and the overhearers might panic and say, how, do we need to build a hedge around the hedge? How far away from this thing do we need to get to be considered obedient? It's not a quantitative righteousness, however. It is a qualitative righteousness that needs to be exceeding the scribes and the Pharisees. Jesus said that if we want to enter the kingdom of heaven, we must have a righteousness that exceeds their righteousness qualitatively, the quality of that righteousness. Let me summarize verse 20 and really the whole point that Jesus is driving at here by bringing up for you three law fulfillers. I'm going to give you three different law keepers. Law keeper one, the law keepers, in quotes. The Pharisees, the law keepers. They're the supposed law keepers. Their law keeping, however, if you look at the text, does not end with them in heaven, right? Their version of law keeping leads straight to hell. Jesus says that that those who have the same kind of a righteousness as the Pharisees will not enter the kingdom of heaven, that they are going to hell. These so-called law keepers were not actually law keepers, Jesus referred to them in the book of Matthew as hypocrites. And hypocrisy is simply giving off the impression that you are something or that you do something when in fact you are not what you are claiming to be and you don't do what you claim to do. That's what Jesus called these law keepers, hypocrites. In the case of the Pharisees, the impression that they gave off is that they were devoted to the Lord. That's the impression they were giving off, that I am devoted to the Lord and his law such that I will even create additional commands to make sure that I don't disobey. I am the one who is obeying. Yet their obedience was merely external and inwardly they were filled with all sorts of evil. Their law keeping was merely external. Jesus pronounces several woes upon them in Matthew 23, if we stay within this book. And he calls them hypocrites over and over. Here's what he indicts them for. He indicts them for their wicked leadership. He tells them that they make disciples that are twice as much a child of hell as they are. He exposes their intricate tithing of herbs, but their neglect of justice, mercy, and faithfulness. He tells them they wash the outside of the cup, while inside it's all full of wickedness. He calls them whitewashed tombs filled with dead bones. Though their exterior appears righteous, they are actually dead. That is what Jesus calls these disciples. He describes them that way in Matthew 23. And though they give the appearance of being law keepers, in reality they don't obey the Lord and their hearts are far from him. And these Law keepers, stay with me, have the audacity to accuse Jesus of bringing a message and living a lifestyle that seeks to put away the law of God. These law keepers who are hypocrites are the ones that are saying Jesus is not a law keeper. Jesus has to inform his disciples that he's not denigrating the law. Who are the ones denigrating the law, however? The hypocrites. Jesus refutes that. 
He says he hasn't come to abolish the law, but to be the fulfillment of it. And everything Jesus says from this point on in the Sermon on the Mount is based off the principle that what he has to say is consistent with the law of God and is not contradictory. The law keepers, the Pharisees, the hypocrites, the self-righteous, their false righteousness will lead them straight to hell. These are the first law keepers in the text. Then we have the law keeper, the law keeper, Jesus Christ himself. He is the law keeper. I've already said much on how Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and that he is the law keeper. So I won't say much more, but remember with me that apart from Jesus Christ, there is no perfect law keeper. He is the only law keeper. No one else has kept the three aspects of the law perfectly and is the fulfillment of it. There is no other name under heaven by which we might be saved. We need someone who has fulfilled the law, someone who is a law keeper. And there is only one, there is only one individual who can be our hope, and that is Jesus Christ, the righteous. This is the beauty of the gospel. God takes lawbreakers And he imputes to them the title of law keeper through the imputed righteousness of the law keeper himself. Jesus gives lawbreakers a righteousness that exceeds the Pharisees. He gives them his own righteousness. Hallelujah. The law keepers, the final one, the the law keepers. Finally, Christians, the law keepers. This isn't a title that uh, we often associate with, is it? Uh, we, we don't often, I, I, if I were to address you, oh, beloved, you'd be like, yeah, that makes sense that we hear that from John. Or if I said, believers, yeah, we, we associate with that. But if I said, listen to me, law keepers, that won't be a title that we're familiar with calling ourselves or hearing us called. We don't think about that very often. We are the people, though, however, that must have a superior righteousness than the Pharisees, a superior quality of law keeping than the Pharisees. In verse 20, I don't believe that Matthew is is pointing to the imputed righteousness that that Paul is pointing to when he says you have to have a righteousness that exceeds that of the Pharisees. I don't think he's talking about imputational righteousness like Paul. We've already discussed this in uh, the Beatitudes when he says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, right? He wasn't talking about blessed are those who hunger and thirst for the imputed righteousness of Jesus, but he's saying blessed are those who hunger and thirst to walk righteously, right? And so consistent with how Matthew is using the word righteous in the text, um, I believe that he's saying that you must have a righteousness, practical righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees. That sounds strange maybe, but I think that's what he's saying. Matthew is using the word righteousness in the same way he's been using it so far in the gospel, practical righteousness. It's about the righteous demonstration of our lives in practical deeds. The Pharisees were hypocrites. Their righteousness was false. Christians must have a legitimate righteousness that comes from a sincere devotion and obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. But you might say to me now, Pastor Alex, we are not under the law, but under grace. You've even said this. So why do I need to be a law keeper? Why are you saying it that way? Aren't you being a little legalistic by telling me I have to be a law keeper? Do you really think Jesus is saying I have to have a practical righteousness? Isn't that a little legalistic? First, let me say this. What does the text seem to indicate? It seems to indicate that our lives need to be marked by a sincere obedience rather than a pharisaical hypocrisy. I don't write the mail, I just deliver it. What does the text indicate? Before we bring a charge against someone of being legalistic for insisting that we must have a legitimate obedience, think about what the text says. But next, let me say this. Why do we have a tension between law and grace? Why do we believe that these are opposites that are opposed to one another? Listen, they are not mutually exclusive. And in fact, they are deeply intertwined with one another. In fact, you must be a law keeper, according to this text, or you are not a Christian. Follow with me. 
The grace of having the righteousness of Jesus Christ imputed to us leads to us to be law keepers, right? That seems to be what's indicated here. We're called law keepers. So there's no tension between the grace of the gospel and the reality of us being law keepers. There exists no tension outside of your own disagreement. That is the only tension that you have between law and grace. You either don't understand it fully, which is fine, or you disagree with it, which doesn't seem to hold up to the light of Scripture. In fact, John in his gospel seems to interchange obedience with faith. If you love me, you will obey me, right? So if you read the gospel of John, you'll notice that he could use the word believe often, but he uses the word obey because they seem to be synonymous. Consider with me two of the most prominent new covenant prophecies in the Old Testament, okay? Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, which I'm not going to read, but it says the same thing as the one I will read, which is Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27. These are the two Mount Everests of the new covenant prophecy, right? These are the ones we would go to, to to understand what the new covenant is according to the Old Testament. Here's what Ezekiel 36 says, and listen carefully. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you. And then what, is it, what does the spirit do? And cause you to walk in my statutes and obey all of my rules. Which statutes? Which rules? The law. What is the work of the Holy Spirit in the new covenant? To make you obedient to the law. What is this grace of the new covenant? To make you obedient to the law. Grace includes law. This is the new covenant promise for new covenant people. This would have energized the Jews who were failing to keep the law. They would have said, Thank you, God, that you are putting your spirit within me that I can finally obey the law. Because that's all the information that they had. We have more than what they had. We understand that that new covenant law-keeping is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And then now we are now energized to obey the Lord. Amen. Even though the law takes on a new function, its moral requirements are essentially the same. Therefore, God putting his spirit in us causes us to obey the law. Because it's consistent in terms of what God calls us to concerning loving him, worshiping him, and walking in obedience according to what he loves and hates. The Holy Spirit of God, New Covenant Christian, indwells you and causes you to obey the law of God. That's what it does. The Holy Spirit causes us to legitimately, sincerely, truly obey the law of God. We become law keepers. So it's not weird for me to say, good morning, law keepers. Because that is who you must be if you are a follower of Jesus. This is the difference between hypocrisy and sincerity. Faking it and devotion. Pharisee and Christian. Law keeping qualitative law-keeping, reality and sincerity in the walk of holiness. If you think for a second that your disobedience is irrelevant, it is not. In fact, your obedience is everything in the demonstration of whether or not you are a Christian. If the pattern of your life is to obey the law of God, rest assured you will be in heaven. But also be aware and beware that if you have deluded yourself like the Pharisees into thinking that you have a righteousness despite the wickedness within and the desire to do evil that's not merely flesh but the pattern of your life, rest assured you're going to hell. You must repent. You must have a superior righteousness. You must have a better righteousness than that. You must have God's spirit indwelling you and causing you to obey the law of God. Otherwise, you cannot claim the new covenant promise as your own. There is supreme assurance in knowing that you are walking in obedience. And there is fear and trembling when you see yourself fall. 
I'm not denigrating your assurance, but I'm causing you to examine what the text is saying and see, God, is this me? I pray you have massive assurance from this text as you see your pattern of your life walking into obedience. Those who receive the grace of God through the gospel will be law keepers. So let me ask you, are you a law keeper? Are you? Jesus says in verse 17 through 20 that he is the fulfillment of the law. He's the hope of righteousness. That he has completed it on your behalf. That if you come to him in faith and repentance, you will be given his righteousness, a right standing with God, but not just that, that you'll begin to walk in righteousness. That it'll become the pattern of your life to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself as demonstrated in loving one another as Jesus has loved you in Christ, forgiving one another, and serving one another, and washing each other's feet. That will become the f- desire of your life to walk in that obedience, and you'll see it play out over time. Amen. Because the Holy Spirit will not begin a work And fail to complete it. You will not somehow go without seeing the fruit of the work of the Holy Spirit. To think that that is a possibility is to say that the Holy Spirit is an invalid who can do nothing. No. The Holy Spirit will accomplish a work in you. And it will be evident in the fruitfulness of your obedience. Your practical righteousness. We're left considering whether our righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees. And and follow on with me. I told you that the statement in verse 20 is the thesis statement of Jesus' sermon. Jesus is going to start upping the ante of what it looks like to have a superior righteousness. If you start looking at the overall structure of the sermon and you realize this is his point, that you have to have a superior righteousness, it won't be surprising that he starts upping the ante of that righteousness to separate it from the hypocritical righteousness of the Pharisees. That's what he's driving at. He's trying to show you what the difference is between anger and murder, lust and adultery. He's driving in that direction. And what ends up happening in this masterful sermon is that you start to realize that you are a lawbreaker, that the depth of law keeping exposes the heart in this gospel sermon. And Jesus drives it to the end. You can even page over to to chapter 7, verse 24. He's driving it to his conclusion, of course, like a good pastor does. He's driving it to the point that we get to the end of ourselves and we recognize that either we build our life on the rock or we build our life on the sand. The distinction of the sand being the righteousness of the Pharisees and the rock being the righteousness of Jesus and then practical righteousness outflowing, right? This is the thesis and then it ends in the conclusion, the call, the call. Which kind of foundation is your life built upon? The rock of Jesus Christ or the sand of the Pharisees? His sermon is intentionally leading us to think about what it means to have an exceeding righteousness. So friends, let us come to the rock. Let us build our lives upon the rock of our salvation. Let us come to the one who is the fulfillment of the law. I implore you, if your life is built upon the sand... Eternal judgment will come and you will be destroyed because you are not righteous enough. You must have your life transplanted onto the rock. God must take you from the sand and place you upon the rock by you crying out, Have mercy on me, God. I'm a sinner in need of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You must believe, and in believing, God will take you from the sand and place you on the rock, and when the storms and the wind howl upon you of eternal judgment, your house will stand because Jesus is your foundation. 
Everything built upon that rock is your righteous life. Through his spirit, church, we can live a life of legitimate obedience. Apart from him, we can do nothing. Apart from him, we are hypocritical Pharisees. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor, labor in vain. But rest assured, when your house is built upon the rock, you will have a house of righteous deeds and a righteousness that exceeds that of the Pharisees. So do not think that Jesus has come to abolish the law, church, but he is the fulfillment of it in your life. And the outworking of that is righteous deeds, which are superior to those of the Pharisees. Let's pray together. God, we are desperate for righteous lives. We know sin's destruction. And we know your call upon us, and yet we fall short. So we praise you for the grace of the gospel. Jesus, your righteousness is our only assurance in life. We believe, Jesus, that that your righteousness works itself out in our lives. And I pray today that it would work itself out freely in our lives, that we would be ready to confess our sins to you, that we would be eager to put away our hypocritical, fake, false righteousness. That our hearts would be exposed, that our minds would be open to the deception, the web that we've created, and that we would cling to the rock. Lord, if there's anybody here who has not believed upon you for salvation, I pray that you would press upon them, Holy Spirit, their need for an alien righteousness, for the righteousness of Jesus Christ. God, be merciful to us. Lord, show yourself strong in giving individuals here the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And Lord, for us who believe, give us righteous demonstrations in our life. Righteous deeds cause us to walk in more unison with your law. That we might say, I love your law. I love what you love, Jesus, and I hate what you hate. Please bring us out of the delusion of loving what's evil and hating what's good. And Lord, help us to get it right because we love you, because you're worthy because you deserve to have a people that follows you and seeks holiness. You are worthy. So we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.